Hi, everybody, and welcome to this fourth and final virtually virtual uh, YouTube Q, uh, Orthodoxy Q&A. Uh, That's the longest title ever. <laughs> our virtual, virtual show. Yeah. Our, our virtually virtual Vir show. Virtually virtual Orthodoxy Questions Answered live but not live pre-recorded show. Pre-recorded show. That's right. Try wow. fitting that on a YouTube t uh, title description. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, but uh, if everything works out great and, uh, and our flights are not canceled, uh, next week's show is going to be back to be in live again so uh let's hope for that not just back to being live it'll be our our 100th episode our 100th episode okay i mean again i'm not gonna be crying the blues if i gotta spend another week in scotland okay but you know we gotta get back and we gotta get back to work right it's work to be done so we've got kind of an interesting icon today. In fact, we've got a heretical icon, and we've been talking about heretical icons on the show, and I thought it was about time that we got to see one. Uh, this one, as you can see, depicts Jesus, but also depicts God the Father, shows him as an old man with the white beard. Uh, many of the Orthodox churches, if they've been built at the turn of the century, at 20s, 30s, you'll see this icon there. And in fact, we had one at the seminary. I think I said that in one of the previous shows. This is usually referred to as the Ancient of Days. Now, here's where we get into this whole argument about can we depict something divine on an icon? Because we certainly know that both in, uh, in Judaism and in Islam, uh, you cannot do that. This is the problem, is because what's being depicted here is that which no man can look upon. It's the face of God. All right. So from that standpoint, this is something that violates the second commandment. Thou shall have no graven images, you know, before you. And so in this case, right, we're creating an icon of something that cannot be seen by human eyes. So what about Jesus? Well, certainly Jesus now is or sorry, Jesus uh, was born fully human. We are depicting Jesus in his humanity not in his divinity. So we can depict him as being fully human as we would depict other saints who are alive, just as we can depict photographs of Demos' parents and grandparents and my parents and grandparents. So we can do that. So, so, but I just wanted to uh, just show one of those, what we would consider to be heretical icons. Uh, real quick. So by that, by that uh, perspective, uh, would the um, Michelangelo's painting in the Sistine Chapel that depicts God the Father, would that be considered heretical? Uh, no, because it's not an object of worship. I mean, I, I should, it's not an object of veneration. We venerate the icons because we look upon them and we contemplate the prototype that is there. Leonardo da Vinci is... Yeah, Ma Michelangelo. Is, oh, my, sorry. Michelangelo is just painting for art's sake. Okay. So he is depicting what he believes to be the face of God, but there's no veneration going so on. So there's that distinction, because if we compare to, to Islam, any depiction of Muhammad, regardless of whether it's for veneration or in art, is prohibited. Always, so, always. So even art is... Uh, even art is prohibited. So... Um, but I thought there. I thought I had seen some some pictures that people had drawn of of uh, Muhammad under the tree, or I didn't think. It's, I thought art was okay, but it's, exactly, it's prohibited. I don't know if there's a, if there is any kind of distinction uh, within the Muslim culture, um, but generally, I mean, cartoonists have famously been killed and shot. Or let me rephrase: shot and killed. <laughs> okay, killed and then shot. Yeah, yeah killed. I mean, it, it, so actually, you know what? We're going to throw this on our listeners. Uh, for those of you that are listening and and happen to know from a reliable source, can in the Muslim fa in in the in 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 uh, in Islam, can are are there pictures that depict? Uh, Muhammad and during his life, what he's done, as the same way that we would be, depict Jesus going through the course of his life. So that's an interesting question to throw out there. All right. Speaking of questions, uh, the first one, we actually got uh, several variations of this question, and uh, a few of them are a little bit confusing, but we're going to combine them into one. Uh, so the first part, if your sins have been forgiven, can you be blocked from accessing heaven for any reason? 
Oh, absolutely. Because what are you doing tomorrow? Right? Remember, remember St. John Christum. So, um, I am saved. I was saved. I am being saved. I will be saved. So, you can't just live in the past or the present. You also have to live in the future knowing that I continuously sin. Okay, so the sins that you have been absolved from are those sins that you have committed and you have confessed those sins. You have received the sacrament of, of absolution and confession or vice versa. But now you enter into new sin. So you constantly have to recognize that you stand, you, you teeter on the brink of salvation, meaning that, that there's something tomorrow that I do that I need to be forgiven, and that next day, and the next day. That is one thing that we do know that we are sinners. So the answer is, is yes, you can be blocked if you feel that just because I have confessed these sins, that going forward, everything is going to be okay. And there's the sin of pride. <laughs> or the sin of ignorance. <laughs> well, uh, a second part to this is, uh, can a person who is not forgiving have a path to heaven? That's, okay, again, we can be very technical with that too. Um, so the Orthodox Church does require the act of forgiveness, meaning that you must forgive. What we don't do, as many as many Christian denominations do sometimes, is we they don't the Orthodox don't put a time limit on it. We're not saying that you have to forgive that person within five minutes or by the end of the week or by the end of the month. We don't know what that process of forgiveness is. But we do know that the longer that you hold that unforgiveness, the more it will develop like a cancer in you, and it will call, it will make a change. It will be a metania in the wrong direction. Okay, so the forgiveness is not only the healing for that person that you've forgiven, but it is also for your healing too, because you need to move on to these events and. And as Jesus says, you are not called just to love your friends, but hate your enemies. But I call you to a new commandment to love also your enemies. And so that means at some point you have to give uh, you, you have to offer forgiveness. So the answer would have to be a uh, have to be a very difficult. Yes, that if you remain that you do not forgive, then how is your heavenly father then going to forgive you? Before we move on to the next question, I just want to do a follow-up to the first part of this question, which was about um, about confession and the sins committed before and after confession. So, um, if if I get if I confess and I have my sins forgiven, right, and the next day, you know, I commit a couple of sins in the morning, and then oh, a, a truck just hit me. Oh no! I mean, am I going to be condemned for those sins I did in between? I mean. Well, you didn't have a t you didn't have a chance to even to confess in your own mind just just to say uh, Jesus Christ our Lord forgive me for the sins which I have committed. You didn't have time to do that because you just got hit by the truck, right? There's a big truck. Yeah. Well, you know, we hope that God is God, right? That's all. I, that's all I can tell you at this point. We hope that God is God. You know. Um, you know, because remember, the Orthodox don't get into the magnitude of sins, right? Venial, mortal, we don't get into that whole thing, you know? So, come on, it was just a little bit of gossip and then got hit by a train. As opposed to, ah, I just shot this guy, now I got hit by a train. Uh, you know, I mean, we don't get into so that. So, there'll be some economia based on your life? Which is, which is why... You know, you can. I think that's a great reason why um, the Jesus prayer should always be on your lips. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. If that is always on your lips, then I say you're a little safer. <laughs> All right, just watch the, the street before you cross it. And then watch, right. yes, and try to be careful yourself, too. All right, the next one is from Jack Sage Phoenix. Uh, regular on this program has a uh, long, complicated question, so we're going to hit this up uh, one by one. In what circumstance does orthodoxy consider violence justified, given Jesus' Jesus's instructions to turn the other cheek? 
Is it ever justified? Now, there are some verses that he provided for comparison, but before we move on to those verses, why don't we tackle this uh, this first part here? Sure. And in fact, uh, in the, I've been doing the, um, uh, uh, for the last, uh, oh, I'd say three, four months, I've been doing the uh, virtual Bible study, the Zoom Bible study, and we've been looking at the, at the Gospel of John. Um, and uh, we got up to about <laughs> chapter 9 <laughs> out of uh, like 24, 25 chapters here. Uh, so it's going to be a little while. We're gonna, we took a break over summer, and we're going to continue back. So any of you that would like to join us, uh, we, uh, we do a lot of different things. Uh, we, I know a little bit of a commercial here, but it's kind of like YouTube, right? Um, so we'll do a book of the Bible. We've done the, the book of Mark. We're on the uh, Gospel of John. We've done books that we've done uh, book studies on. So uh, starting back in September, uh, we're going to be doing that. So any of you that would like to join us for that Bible study, please, please, please uh, email me. Let me know, and I will put you on the list so that you can have the YouTube link. But um, getting back to uh, to uh, Jack's question here, if we go to my study guide, okay, and that study guide is available on our resource on our on our website under education and then resources Gospel of John. When we were in chapter two, and we started looking at uh, Jesus in the temple, which is certainly a violent act, uh, I talked about the idea of what is the orthodox stance on. On violence, and the and Patriarch Bartholomew in one of his statements talked about this. So I'm going to read it to you so that you can see it. War and violence are never means used by God in order to achieve a result. They are for the most part machinations of the devil used to achieve unlawful ends. We say for the most part because, as is well known. In a few specific cases of the Orthodox Church, in a few specific cases, the Orthodox Church forgives an armed defense against oppression and violence. However, as a rule, peaceful resolution of differences and peaceful cooperation are more pleasing to God and more beneficial. Thus, there is no ethical region, reason for waging war or violence in the writings of the Greek fathers. So we do not have the concept of a just war, as let's say the Catholic Church would have. So the answer to the the, the answer to that question is that there is never an instance where war or violence are appropriate in an Orthodox sense, and that can go very uh, that that can be very difficult in an American society that tends to follow more Judaic rules than they do Christian rules because we will find reasons why we should go to war and we have done that throughout our history but for orthodoxy there is no justification for war or violence period okay and 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 in fact what we see in the early church is we see people going to their death voluntarily and joyfully singing rather than escaping and fighting back. Before we go on to the verses, um, I do have a question. So you're saying that there is never any justification for, for war. Or violence. Or violence. So well, let's just say hypothetically, right? Um, there's, uh, there's another country right next to my country, okay? And I know for a fact that they're kidnapping uh christians even coming into my land and kidnapping christians from our from our land and torturing them and killing them and they're laughing about it right is wouldn't that be a justification to go in and, and stop that nope not according to orthodoxy no i mean again it doesn't make sense to us because we feel that we need to justify the violence that has been perpetrated upon our our people, right? We feel necessary to justify that. Okay, this is not what we saw in the early church. The, Christ, the Christians did not run in and rescue them from the lions or rescue them from the gladiators. They did not do that because they knew they were being martyred for a cause. It was their nonviolence that that gained them such a reputation. Now, now again, remember. He said, the patriarch says, we say for the most part, because it is well known that, that in a few specific cases, the church has forgiven an armed defense against impression and violence. 
Okay. We we know that we live in a real world. Okay. But he, we can't sanction that. Because the, 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 the thing that pops into my mind is, you know, I'd feel like the other guys, you know, in, in the Good Samaritan tale, that they see somebody suffering, they just walk by. It's not my problem. But then it takes one, you know, a Good Samaritan to come in and actually help that the wounded individual. If, if that was happening, I was in a country, I'm like, oh, it's it, they're being tortured. It, it's terrible to be them, but I'm not going to get involved. Am I not? We did have that. We did have that in our history, too. OK, but would that make me no better than those other people that walked by instead of the Samaritan who stopped and helped? OK, I, mean, I know it's not a direct. It's not a direct comparison, but you understand. No, no, no. I, I think I think it's a very good comparison because the Christian response is to substitute yourself for that person. That's the Christian response. So it's not to fight back, but it's to offer myself who, right? Would you lay down your life for your brother? Okay, now let's be realistic here, all right? Um, we, have, we have seen <laughs> the political consequences of that nonviolent stand. Remember, uh, remember Dukakis? <laughs> what he said about uh, what he said ab about uh, uh, his his wife was. Um, I forgot uh, uh, her name. Um, oh, Kathy. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, they asked him about what would you do if so Kitty, uh, what would you do if somebody would have would have raped your wife? And then he didn't give the answer of, you know, I would, you know, and that lo pretty much lost him the election. Trying to make up for it by riding around in a tank. And right, yes, <laughs> which, which he, you know, which he ended up looking like uh, like Beetle Bailey. So that didn't help him either. All right. So there was there was a ramification for that. All right. Now, again, I would say and I think, Demos, you'd have to agree for yourself if somebody was going to. If you saw somebody perpetrating violence on the Unicia, or I saw somebody perpetrating violence upon Terry, okay, I would act, okay? Um, and I would probably act violently, and then I would have to ask for forgiveness later. So not everybody is called to that martyr-level task, you know? All right. Uh, now, Jack has uh, offered a couple of um, uh, verses as a compare and contrast. Okay. Uh, he offered Matthew 5, 39 to 45. Oh, hold up, wait a minute, let me get to, <laughs> get to that. Matthew yeah. 5, 39 to 45. So let's read that real quick. All right, 39 to 45. All right. But I say to you, do not resist one who is evil. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Okay, again, just what we've been talking about, right? And if anyone would sue you and take your coat, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go a mile, go two miles. Give to him who begs from you, and do not refuse him who would borrow from you. Um, now he would like us to compare and contrast that to two other verses. John 2.15, which you kind of touched on already. And I'll, I'll mention the other one in a moment. All right. 15, uh, John 2, 15. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all with the sheep and the oxen out of the temple, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away, you shall not make my father's house a house of trade. So this is Jesus flipping the table. And the other one is Luke twenty two thirty six. And Jesus said to them, when I sent you out with no purse or no bag or no sandals, did you lack anything? And the apostles answered, nothing. He said to them, but now let him who has a purse take it and likewise a bag and let him who has no sword sell his mantle and buy one. So now how do you reconcile the uh, turn the other cheek to get a sword and then flip a table. I'm not 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 all at once, but <laughs> but how do you how do you um, that seems like a contradiction on face value. It and and it uh, and it does. So if we look at uh, if we look at John's uh, John chapter two first, okay. Um, so we do have we do have the idea, and I'm just going back to the uh, I'm just going back to my my study guide here, okay. And what we have to be careful of is, is in the reading. It does give us the idea now that John is presenting Jesus as this, as this very, uh, very uh, 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 violent uh, uh, Messiah uh, who is acting in the manner of which the Jews expected. 
All right. Um, now, what we have to see is a couple of things here first. So the question here is, can we determine what Jesus' actions were when using the whip? John's gospel in, is unique in that he presents a three-part sequence. This is evident in other gospels, but here there's a three-part sequence in this cleansing event that Jesus does. First, Jesus drove away from the temple courts the sheep and the cattle. Second, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Third, he verbally rebuked those who sold the doves and said, get these out of here. Okay, By highlighting the distinctions, the orthodox interpretation is that each one of these actions is unique and separate from the other actions. So that when we see the word all here in John, we don't necessarily tie it to the people. There is not a solid, uh, uh, there's, there's not a solid connection that he used the whip on the people. Now, if you're going to drive large animals out, okay, then you would fashion then a whip. And in the Greek, the whip is not the type of whip that the, it was the torturous type of whip that was used uh, during the uh, during the um, the torture of of Jesus Christ. All right, so we could simplistically read this and see the word pandas pandas as referring to everybody that is in there. But then why would John then separate out all of these? So we don't see the whip as an act of violence against the people, we see it as a tool that is used to drive and move large animals. And then the other actions that we see are not directed at the people, but are directed at the actions, the verbal rebuking, and then the turning over of the, of the tables, because again, the money was being changed in the temple area. So in that sense, we can, we can, we can somewhat reconcile Jesus's behavior, is that he wasn't going around and whipping people from our perspective. All right. And this is, seems to be the point of confusion that Jack goes into more detail on. That Jesus' message seems to be that sometimes self-defense is okay, other times it's not. Sometimes violence in defense of family, church, and community is okay, sometimes it's not. And it's better to die than to sin. Therefore, I'm wondering, what is Orthodox, the Orthodox Church's take on all of this? Okay, so again, there there is no justification, I mean, we can't be clearer than that. There is no justification for violence, period. But... But the church understands that not everybody can live to that standard. Not everybody can live to that martyr standard. Okay, so once that action, once that sin has been committed, then that person is going to have to come to confession and have to be truly repentant for what it is that he did. This now, excuse me, this can be very problematic because you, if you've done something, if you've, if you've perpetrated violence on somebody and for some reason you feel justified in that violence, okay, then you're not going to seek confession because you're thinking, confess what? I didn't sin. And this, and this clearly shows that you do not have the orthodox mind of how we view violence. Okay, it it shows that it it leans more towards a towards a Judaic idea that you can now defend yourself. So the Orthodox Church is not saying that you wouldn't defend yourself, but the Orthodox Church is saying that you have used a means that is inappropriate for a Christian who lives or is wanting to live a Christ-like life. All right. It kind of reminds me of the old MacGyver TV show, The Contradiction. He was, uh, he was blatantly anti-gun. They had many episodes about how guns were bad. We had no problem building a bomb out of pine cones. And, uh, oh, yeah, well, that's, you know, <laughs> he, he, yeah, right, right. <laughs> Um, um, so, so I, you know, I, and uh, and again, I know that that in America, this is a very difficult stand to have, and and for me as to present an orthodox position that says there is no case for violence, and people say, of course, there's a case for violence. You saw my family, you saw my country, you know. So we wouldn't have this country if what? it wasn't for violence. 
It's, I mean, we, 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 it was, it was found, it it was founded on revolution. Exactly. Exactly. Right. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have this country. I mean, for that part, I mean, didn't the Greeks fight the Turks? They they fought the Ottoman empire, right? Fought in World War II. Okay. They, right. We fought in World War II. So the church understands that war and violence is a reality. Okay. But that doesn't negate the fact that it doesn't require afterwards then a confession, tears of repentance, and then absolution. And one final uh, follow-up uh, from Jack. I know the Catholic Church maintained militant orders, uh, and for example, the Knights Templar, throughout the middle the European Middle Ages. But the Orthodox Church doesn't seem to have anything comparable. Is this related to the Orthodox Church's position on violence? Or were there other factors at work? Well, that's not that's not true at all. Because uh, when we were on the Holy Mountain, when we were on Mount Athos, uh, some of the monks showed uh, took us downstairs to the basement of one of these uh, one of the monasteries, and there was the largest weapons arsenal I have seen since I was in the military. Oh, boy. I mean, with uh, rifles, of uh, rifles, and and they showed us pictures of monks. Wearing bandoliers against, uh, you know, across their chest. Who is that? Pancho Villa. They all look like they all they were monks, and they look like Pancho Villa because they had these gun belts cr- strapped. So they're, so they're Greek Pancho Villas. Greek Pancho Villas. So this idea that we've never done that before—that is untrue. <laughs> Aaron eighty-eight two hundred five has a suggestion, uh, a recommended book for spiritual reading, and what I'm curious to see if you've read it. And I'm going to completely butcher the name of the author, but I'm going to give it a shot. My Life in Christ by St. John of Kronstadt. Kronstadt. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fantastic spiritual wisdom. A bit long at 500 pages, but worth it. Are you familiar with the book? I I am familiar with the book. I started to read it and then uh, got way late. I have not not finished the book. But, hey, this, uh, you know. Uh, I know that we're filming this early, so I technically haven't left for Scotland yet. You're seeing this while I'm in Scotland, but I technically haven't left yet. So you know what? I think what I'm going to do is I got some time on the plane. It's uh, is it to Europe? It's what two hours? Yeah, yeah, it's only, a, it's only an hour and a half. Hour and a half, yeah, right? Yeah, so I've got a little bit of time to to read that. So I'm going to I'm so that you've given me a project now. <laughs> Anonymous asks, is disease a punishment for sin? Absolutely not. Okay. Um, now, having said that, of course, there's there's always the qualifier, right? But that is a Judaic thought that and and remember, we see this in the we see this in the Bible. The man born blind at birth. Okay. And what is the what is the question that the Pharisees ask? Who sinned, this man or his parents? So there is clearly a tie in Judaism between, or at least historically, there's been a tie between being afflicted, things like leprosy and and, uh, and other diseases, blindness, that uh, was a cause for something that happened in the family. It was a punishment from God. All right. The Orthodox Church does not see see it in that way. And again, we we have here the uh, however a rule peaceful resolution differences are more pleasing to God and more beneficial to humankind, meaning that God only wants to see us healthy and praising him. That's what he wants. But we live in a disease-ridden world. We live in a fallen world that has now disease. Okay? So in that sense, um, disease is part of where we live. So we can bring this upon ourselves. So that's kind of the qualifier. So If I drink four bottles of whiskey a day and I die from cirrhosis of the liver, do I blame this on God? Do I say that God caused it? No, it's my use of free will. Okay, if I overeat and I and if I eat the wrong things and I get gout, is that now God's fault? No. So. So, yes, we can cause our own uh, uh, afflictions and pain and, and despair. But that does not come from God. There's another perspective on this um, that, yeah, disease is a punishment for sin, but a very specific sin, original sin. 
If it wasn't for original sin, we wouldn't have disease. Oh, so as, yes, yes. The, the consequence yeah. of the original sin is we live in a fallen and diseased world. Yes. And and that's the only thing that can help us explain why young children get cancer. I mean, what have they done wrong? I mean, I mean, how, what do we say that God inflicted them with cancer? No, but we live in a fallen world that can produce defective genes and, and then kids get cancer. So, so we certainly can't blame that on the, on the, on either God, nor can we blame that on the children because they've done something wrong. CM Cordero asks a question in regards to a video about interfaith marriages and so forth. Uh, yeah. First, a comment that they love the acceptance of uh, our acceptance, I guess, in the video of the dignity of other faiths. Mm -hmm. Oh, but that they thought that Orthodox Christians could only marry other Christians. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely correct. Right now, the Orthodox Church allows only inter-Christian marriages. So inter-Christian obviously means other faiths that worship a Trinitarian God. Right. So in that sense, we are open only to Protestant domination denominations, Catholic and then obviously Orthodox. And there are and, and so there are other like obviously that excludes uh, Judaism. It excludes uh, Islam, but it also excludes things like um, uh, Unitarian um, uh, 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 Mormons. Yeah. Right. Latter Day Saints. Right. Is that the Church yeah, yeah. of Church of Latter Day Saints? It excludes that. Um, it excludes uh, you know uh, 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 Buddhist or Taoist faiths. So right now we call those then mixed marriages. Inter Christian is the term that the Orthodox use for those marriages that are two Trinitarian believing faiths. All right. Now, interestingly enough, that's America. Because it's still a, it's still a problematic in other countries that they will only allow marriages of Orthodox to Orthodox. So America is a little bit unique in that is that we allow that interchristian marriage. TKMD asks, which ins which apostle inspires you the most, and what life lesson from that apostle do you think is very important today? Well, you know, actually, for me, I think that that's going to be that's going to be pretty easy. Um, it's uh, the Apostle John. Um, one, it is in that gospel that we reach the deep theology of our church. I mean, he is not considered the first theologian of the Orthodox Church for nothing. But the wonderful way that he presents and the simplistic way that he presents it, and not that he's a simpleton, but that he is so succinct in how he writes his gospel and the things that he presents makes his gospel such an easy tool that we can use to spread the Christian message. And the other thing that inspires me about John is that, at least according to Orthodox tradition, the last words on his lips were what we say in the liturgy every Sunday, love one another. I mean, I mean that is, that is at the crux of what Jesus wanted. Love God with all your heart and all your soul. And that is the essence of John's gospel. His love for God shows through in his gospel. And then his final words on his deathbed show then that horizontal component, which is love one another. So from that standpoint, he is my favorite uh, gospel writer. All right. We have a question from Dr. Dreyer. Why do the Christians get all the blame when it comes to the topic of abortion? Criticisms of other faiths often get purged or outright canceled due to bigotry even when some react violently. But with Christians, you can have open death threats, physical attacks, and destruction of churches, and it almost seems state-supported, especially when the media turns a blind eye or makes excuses, fiery but mostly peaceful and such. What can we do to stand up against this? I believe in free speech, but cannot stand the double standard of being made the ultimate villain in today's age. 
Well, I mean, and it's not limited to do limited to just abortion. We now are kind of out front, at least in America, we are we are exiting from our, if I can call it our Pax Romana, the the peaceful times when in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, you know, we were that Christian nation. And so there was really no dissenting voice. I mean, yeah, the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, well, 30s and 40s weren't exactly the peaceful time. <laughs> no, but no, but uh, but uh, but every most people had the same opinion on abortion, on gay rights, on transgender, on, um, on in America, in America, yeah. on social. We had that. Now, some of those were wrong, like, you know, uh, uh, civil rights and, uh, uh, and uh, being against uh, civil rights, being against, yes, yeah, being yeah, yeah. being against <laughs> civil rights. Some of them were some of them were wrong. OK. And gospels, the gospels were used incorrectly. But the mindset was, you know. Abortion is wrong. Adultery is wrong. You shouldn't be living together. Everybody was fairly united on these. So we are exiting that Pax Romana now where society is saying it's time to move on and to forget these old superstitious values. And so you need to embrace all of these new ideas. And now Christianity is called to the carpet to say, why are you not changing? Why are you not cool? Didn't we just have this you know, question? Why are you not cool? Okay, so we are asked, we are being asked by society, you are stuck in the past. If you want, if you want us to respect you, then you will behave in our manner because our value system has evolved and yours hasn't. And certainly the Christian church will say, no, these values cannot evolve. They can be interpreted in the, in the light of where they are, but they cannot be changed. And so because that voice now of dissent has grown much louder and much stronger, we will be persecuted. So there's really nothing that you can do. I mean, you, you are living in a time where we are returning to the persecution of our values. However, I can't leave you without any hope. What you have to do is you have to make the stand that says, here is why society is wrong according to, to firmly rooted truths. And you have to make that that uh, you have to make that argument. You may convince some people and other people will hate you for it. And other people will uh, will malign you for that and call you crazy. And uh, you're a traditionalist and you don't like uh, what's uh, you don't like the, the what society is doing. And so in that sense, you have to be able to take those um, uh, slings and arrows, they say. Right? Yeah. Is that the term that they bows that both bows and arrows? Okay. So you're gonna have to you're gonna have to realize that that's what we're gonna have to do. But small things that we can do, like when we go to a restaurant, I know that when I go out with Presbytera, before we have the meal, we always make the sign of the cross. Okay. Now, so far we haven't had anybody that has reject has come up and spit in our face or done anything like that. But I would not be surprised. If somebody would do that and say, ah, look at what you're doing. All right. Now, on the issue of, you know, you spoke specifically about abortion. All right. The problem or the, the key issue, I think, with abortion is is that our stand is so very is, is so very um, strict. Uh, so very strict. Yes, thank you. So very strict. We do not allow extenuating circumstances and we, number one, no extenuating circumstances. And number two, life begins at conception. Those two ideals make us a pariah in today's society because those two issues are being debated. No, life doesn't begin. It begins 24 hours or it begins at birth or it begins 30 days after birth. So there's all these varying opinions and you ha and you are required now to honor these different opinions and we are saying no we will not here is our two stands and that's it we've been moving away from religion in general the younger generations are not very religious 
Yeah, because uh, because again, the largest, um, the largest re uh, religious denomination now is none. Yeah. Right. Not N U N, but N O N E. Right. <laughs> it's none N U N. <laughs> it's not none. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's that's it's so in the old days, old days. Okay, it used to be. Well, you know what. You know, and, and I've and I've seen that in Orthodox churches that have been. I, I, you know, I don't really understand the Orthodox faith, so I went with my wife, and we became non-denominational, or or we became Catholic, or Catholic becomes Protestant, or. But now we don't see that. The now what the trend is is I'm nothing, I'm just spiritual, right? So I don't need a building, I don't need a church, I don't need a pastor, I don't need a priest. I am my own God. So, so now it they're not moving to different churches. They're just not going. But, and you've said this, Demos, many times, we generally as Christians have done a very poor job of presenting ourselves as intelligent people, right? We tend to say simplistic things. We say silly things. We don't know our faith that well. We can't explain our faith that well. So when people ask us about our truths, we really can't explain it. We we offer them superstitious ideas. Uh, we are, or we offer them just believe. You know. So so we have done a very poor job of showing that we are educated. And that we are knowledgeable of why we have the truth. All right. And one final question from Effie, who asks, If we lose the choice of sin in heaven, which is a sinless plane, don't we lose our individuality? No, indivi no individuality without free will. Part of me thinks this is worse than non-existence. Well, okay, so uh, again, a, a very American ideal, again, because it smacks of uh, individuality. Let's take ourselves back to the Garden of Eden. And in the Garden of Eden, we had Adam and Eve as the first creation of, uh, well, of the first creation of humans, not the first creation of angels, principalities, but the first creation of humans. And there was no sin. Why? Because all that their will was free will, but aligned only with God. So that's what they were able to see. This is why we have Jesus as the new Adam, is because his will, although it's, he, he has two wills, he can only do what the Father wills, not out of force, He's not a robot, but he does that because he understands that that is the truth. That is the, the true will. And so all we're doing in heaven is we are returning to that sinless state that we can no longer turn away from God. Because, because we, we just physically know that this is the truth. What happened during the fall is sin entered the world because we were able to have the knowledge that we could sin. And what heaven does is takes that away from us, is it takes away the ability to, to think evil, to look away from God, to think that we can now rival God. And this clearly is now the error of Satan. But didn't Adam and Eve have the choice to sin with, with the apple? Or, or the fruit? I, I don't think it's very specific. Yeah. They had the choice to, to sin. So because they had the ability to sin in the Garden of Eden, Eden wasn't sin in the Garden of Eden? Well, um, um, sin in the form of the serpent, right? Okay, the sin in the so y yes, sin in the form of the serpent. All right, um, as the adversary at that point, we would call him adversary. So in that sense, um, you know, do we see that as a temptation, right? Because they they were not going to eat we don't have any indication in genesis that eve was going to eat from that tree on her own that was not in her will but it was by entering into a discussion with he who 
it the fruit, is the fruit it, advocate. The, the well, well, <laughs> the fruit, the fruit, the, the fruit advocate. Yeah. All right, all right. But adversary, I think, is the better term yeah, yeah. because because there is an adversarial relationship that existed there, and he's saying to them. You don't know what you don't know, and I'm going to give that to you. And that enters into, or that begins that sinful path. But I can I can understand uh, on a psychological plane this 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 fear because if if I go to heaven, right, and I lose, I mean, do well. Let's let's break it down. I mean, do we still have free will in heaven? Because every everything that's going to be discussed, yes, yes. So if we still have free will, um, how do we not have the ability to sin? Well, how do we know that we don't have that ability, right? Because yeah. if it happened once, why can't it happen again, right? I mean, this is our this is our what do you call it, second chance or or so, right? Yeah. So so again, you know, it, God didn't tell us everything, right? So you know, thinking about that, there is the possibility that this could happen again, absolutely. All right, but you know, I, we we don't believe that that God that God is going to is is going to create now or, or restore for us a place that will allow us to sin. We can use our free will, but hopefully we're going in this with foreknowledge, right? Because now we know. We know the consequences of sinful behavior. That is an interesting perspective because they can't it's not um I mean there wouldn't be I assume there wouldn't be a reversal. We ate from the fruit of, of knowledge. It's not like the moment we go to heaven, that's taken away from us. Right, right. So at that particular point, when we enter the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, we are we're entering a whole different plane altogether. Absolutely, right, yeah. right, right. Mm-hmm. No, you know, you and I can go on and on <laughs> about this topic. Um, so yeah, uh, that's it for today's uh, episode. That was our fourth and final. July. Virtually, virtually virtual episode. Yes, that one. <laughs> that was our because they're all virtual, right? Yeah, virtually virtual, but... virtual pre-recorded live episode. Oh, right. There, there we go. There we go. <laughs> we'll be back next week with a, a traditional live show. You guys can chat in. We're looking forward to seeing you guys. Um, we have um, it will be our one hundredth episode, and Father will have pictures and stuff to show off from uh, from his trip in Scotland. You'll have some beautiful pictures of Greece. I'll have some pictures of Greece. Hopefully, none of our flights are delayed. But apparently, that's been an issue lately. Right. Uh, my, my girlfriend, she she was taking a flight from California to here. It took her 28 hours. 28 hours for what should have been, what, a three-hour flight? Yeah, right. <laughs> that's worse than Gilligan's Island, right? Even Gilligan's Island was only a three-hour tour. Yeah, but, you know, being stuck on an island with Ginger and Marianne, I can think of worse things. Mm-hmm. I don't tell that to my girlfriend, but I can think of... <laughs> All right, so to close out the show, Ginger or Marianne? Oh, Marianne. 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 Okay, Marianne. Marianne. All the way. Okay. Yeah. All right. Ginger was too fake. and I, I But, I, you know, I would have kept her credit. I, you know, she had, what, like 10 years worth of makeup with her <laughs> on the three hours? I know, right? Right? Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know. And nobody could, beat the, nobody could beat the shorts that Marianne wore, right? The way that Marianne wore the shorts. All right, everyone. Have a great night. Have a great night. (laughs) We'll see you next week. Next week. Bye-bye.